You may be seated. Now, you know I don't often do it, but every now and then I bring an object lesson with me. Do you have any idea what's in this bag? <laughs> Remember when we talked about Passover, Pesach, I brought in a Pesach plate that I had purchased when I lived in Israel, and I showed you what each one of those little dishes in that plate were all about, and then it was written in Hebrew, and so afterwards I asked if anybody here could figure out which side was right side up and which side was upside down, because you don't read Hebrew. And Kirk Myers actually figured it out. There he is coming in the back. Kirk actually figured it out. you know how he figured it out? He felt the back of the plate to find where the little hanger was. He said, that's the top. <laughs> I have another object lesson for us today, but you'll have to wait for just a little bit before we get to that. Take your Bibles and turn back with me, if, to, if you will, to that portion of scripture that we read just a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 14, verses 1 through 9. Now, last week, we picked up a few things which we had not quite finished in the text preceding back in chapter 13. And we saw that chapter 13, verse 19 says, And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. That was more than 400 years before the Exodus. A charge that Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, the one you remember who had been sold into slavery down in Egypt, the one who had gone down and then risen to the position of number two in all the land of Egypt, that Joseph, not the husband of Mary, but Joseph, the son of Jacob, had made his brothers promise that they would carry his bones back to the land of Canaan where he would be buried. His body was going to be in Egypt, but his heart was really in the promised land. Now, you know we're going to be having in a few weeks a Fifth Sunday special uh, for missions. And that missionary video is about David Livingston. David Livingston, the missionary explorer in Africa, who actually told everybody around him, when I die, I want you to bury my heart in Africa, even if you take my body someplace else. And he's buried in Westminster today, but his heart is in Africa. Joseph's heart was in the land of promise that God had given to them. And so he made his brothers promise to carry his heart back there, his body. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? Is your heart here on this earth? Is your heart on temporal things? Or is your heart fixed on Christ? Is your heart fixed in heaven? What is most important to you? What is it that you want done so that you might leave a lasting impact? People who focus on money, on position, on sex, on pleasure, they don't leave anything that lasts. What is the focus of your heart? Will you leave something that lasts forever? And so we ask ourselves the question, well, did that happen? You know, that's the very last reference uh, in the very last five verses in the book of Genesis. And then 400 years transpires from the days of Jacob and Joseph until we get down to the Exodus, which we're looking at in our text. 400 years to discipline Israel, to prepare them to follow God. God still had to drag them even after that through 40 years of wilderness wanderings to teach them to trust him. Then he gave them times of war and peace and war and peace and war and peace from Joshua through the judges up to David for the next 400 years. And then he gave them another 400 years to get their act together during the horrendous days of the monarchy and the divided kingdom and the foolishness of Solomon's son. Shows that a wise man can have a stupid son. Solomon's son Rehoboam divided the kingdom and then the Assyrian captivity and the Babylonian captivity. But God always keeps his promises. We looked at those passages of scripture where Joseph commanded his bones to be carried back to the promised land. And then we asked the question, did Joseph's bones actually make it back 
after 400 years buried in Egypt and then being picked up and carried for 40 years through the wilderness wanderings, through all the battles that they fought in the wilderness wanderings, and after they crossed the, the Jordan River and the Battle of Jericho, and all the battles all over the land of Israel, did his bones make it? And we saw, yes, they did. And as strange as it seemed to us last week, the Jews carried those bones through the entire conquest of the land of Canaan and did not bury them until after they buried Joshua. We saw that Joseph's oath ended the book of Genesis and Joseph's burial ends the book of Joshua. We saw that in Joshua chapter 24 and it tells us that they buried Joshua first in verses 29 and 30. It says it came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. They buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnat Serah, which is in Mount Ephraim on the north side of the hill of Gaash. And Israel served the days the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua, which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. The people who've seen the working of God die off. You know that. Look at the empty auditorium. Will we carry it on? And the bones of Joseph, verse 32 which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt. They did it. They buried in Shechem in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died. That first guard is going out. And they buried him in a hill that pertained to Phinehas, his son, which was given him in Mount Ephraim. And so ends the book of Joshua. So ended the book of Genesis, so ends the book of Joshua. We're certain that if God took care of the bones of Joseph, he'll take care of us. He'll take care of you, he'll take care of me too. We noticed also something very interesting. Both Joseph and Joshua died at the age of 110. We noticed also that Jacob gave Joseph the same charge about carrying his body back to the land of promise that Joseph charged his brethren with. That was in Genesis 49. We saw that Joseph did exactly what his father had commanded. Exactly what his father had commanded. And as a result, he received his blessing and his reward more than 400 years later. We don't know when the blessing is going to come to us. We say, but God, I've served you for so long. I've served you for so long. I've obeyed you and I've obeyed you and I've obeyed you and I don't see the results. Have you ever complained to God about that? He said, it just doesn't seem to be working. After all, I've served you for the last 23 minutes. <laughs> we're, we're the microwave mentality, you know. We want it now kind of a stuff. The wheels of God grind slowly, but they grind exceeding fine. God never misses a beat. God always honors his word. God always, always keeps his promises. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Joseph received that promise. It seemed to take a very long time, but he got the promise. He got the blessing that he had so earnestly desired. He said, God is going to someday call you out of Egypt. He knew it wasn't then. But God gave him prophetic vision of the future. He knew that God would keep his promise. That God had sent them to Egypt, but God had given them the land of Canaan. It was theirs by divine right. And he said, someday God's going to bring you back there. I believe it with all my heart. And because I believe it, I give you a command. Take my bones and carry them back with you. That's where I want to be buried permanently. Do you believe the promises of God that much? Do you really believe the promises of God that much? God never fails. God never lies. 
God always keeps his word. The issue is, will we obey his word even when we don't see what we think are results? God's word is true. Obey exactly what God has told you to do. Leave the results up to him. Now, <clears throat> we're going to get to this little um, object lesson here. Did you do your homework? I gave you some homework last time, do you remember? After looking at the narrative of Joseph's bones, we began looking at the mouth of the gorges. And I gave you a homework assignment. How many of you have ever been in school? Well, homeschool counts too, yes. How many of you have ever been in school counting homeschool? Yes, yes. Let's see the hands. Okay, everybody, yeah. Everybody's been in school at least one day, I think. Unless you're a newborn. But I don't see any out here, okay? You've been in school. Did you ever get homework assignments? Everybody who got a homework assignment say amen. Amen. Did you ever miss a homework assignment? Shall I ask for a call of hands, a show of hands? <laughs> some of us probably missed some homework assignments and then we tried to fake it the next day or we said the dog ate it. You know, there are many dogs out there that have stomachs full of paper all during the school year. I mean, it it's happens to be one thing that dogs apparently like, right? The dog eat the homework, right? Well, I gave you homework assignment. It was to look up some place names. It was to check them out on a Bible map at the back of your Bibles. I said, here it was. Try to figure out where Pihahirot, Migdal, and Baal Siphon are located. Now, I gave you the meanings of those names, didn't I? And then I said, you know, those are topographical names. They're describing places. I asked you to try to make sense out of those names in light of the topography on your Bible maps. You know, you've got maps in the back of your Bibles, at least. Even the cheap Bibles usually have maps in the back of the Bibles because it helps sell the Bibles. You know, they got these maps back there in the back. All the journeys of Paul, the first missionary journey, the second missionary journey, the 37th. No, he didn't have 37 missionary journeys. They've got maps in the back. They've usually got a map of the Exodus. It's usually the back of the Bible. If you've got your Bible, you can flip it open. I don't know if your Bible has them, but most, most Bibles have those maps there in the back. Now, question. How many of you did that? You looked at the maps. You tried to figure out where Pihahi wrote, Migdal, and Baal Siphon were located by looking at the maps. So how many of you did that sometime this past week, after the morning worship service last week, and before you came to this service now? Looking at it now doesn't count, okay? But before you came to this service, may I see a show of hands? How many of you did that sometime after last week's service and before this week's service? Anybody? Did even one person do his or her homework assignment? What would a teacher say to you if they gave you a homework assignment and you came to class without your homework assignment done? Would they be happy with you? Everybody who thinks they would be really, really happy say amen. Dead silence. How many of you think they would not be happy with you? Say amen. Amen. There's a mumbled amen out there. Okay. Hmm. Now, I told you some months ago when I gave the test on the ten plagues and reward books for those who had memorized them in order that I would be testing you on other things in the future. Well, today you just had a pop quiz and you all failed. Let me show you what was in the bag. I actually had better hopes for this congregation than what you have shown to me. I had some prizes. For anybody, you didn't have to learn anything. All you had to do was give it a shot. All you had to do was look. It took you how many seconds to flip to the back of your Bible just now and look at the maps? Maybe five seconds? That's all you had to do and see if you could find those names. Pihahirot, Migdal, 
Baal Tsiphon. I even told you what those names mean. Ti Hachirot, Mouth of the Gorges. It's a topographical reference. Migdal, Tower. Baal Tsiphon, Master or Lord of the North. And nobody tried. Let me tell you what you missed. Actually, I'd written down here, could I have a volunteer to pass out the prizes for those who've actually tried to figure out the location of the three place names or who tried to make sense of how they fit into the root of the Exodus? Little prize that I would have given. Got ten of them up here. I had greater hopes than I have been awarded with. Little prize fits nicely with what we're studying. It's called Armageddon Oil and the Middle East Crisis by Dr. John Wolford, the former president of Dallas Theological Seminary. The subtitle, if you can see that far, is what the Bible says about the future of the Middle East and the end of Western civilization. This book is 234 pages long. It costs 10 bucks. There are over 1 million copies in print. I suspect most of you have not read this book. Chapters in the book include Armageddon Calendar, the Israeli-Arab conflict, oil blackmail, Palestine, the land of promise and travail, the city of the prophets, watch Jerusalem, the rising tide of world religion, changing Europe, the coming Middle East peace, the continued threat of Russian intervention, a coming world dictator, a day of world catastrophe, Armageddon, the world's death struggle, Christ's second coming to earth, a promise to remember, and what next? Those are the chapters in this book. You know, our current culture is in a panic right now because of what's happening in the world. I think you're probably aware of that. For those of you who want to be able to use Bible prophetic events in witnessing to our current culture, this book also includes something else. It includes an appendix on how to be sure of our eternal destiny. It even has pictures you can show to the person you're talking to. I certainly hope that you do talk to people about their salvation. But nobody got one. Pop quiz. Those happen every now and then. I don't tell you when they're coming. But if you pay attention, if you take notes, and if you do your assignments, you might discover there's a blessing in it. Okay, now I want you all to understand what I'm talking about. So can I have a volunteer or two to help me pass out some copies of a map? I made some maps for you all today. Just in case your Bible doesn't have one, say, Keith and Kirk, would you guys come and help me pass these out? Okay, and while they're passing those out, uh, last week we talked about why I named the message the mouth of the gorges and talked about the three different names which I've just listed for you. Those are all given to us in our text in Exodus chapter 14, verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pihahirot, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Tsiphon. Before it ye shall encamp by the sea. I gave you the meaning of those three names. Also back in chapter 13, I mentioned two other names, or they are mentioned in the text. You'll actually see those on the map here. Sukkot and Itam, on the edge of the wilderness. Those were back in Exodus chapter 13, verse 20. Now, when we discover the meaning of the names, that helps us to understand exactly where the crossing of the Red Sea took place. It did not take place where the liberals want you to believe it took place. An attack on the Exodus crossing began back in the middle 1800s trying to prove that the Bible did not contain genuine miracles. There was a concerted effort, especially in Germany, among the theologians in Germany, to deny the Bible miracles. And the most stupendous miracle in the Old Testament is the dividing of the Red Sea. And we're going to see when, when we look at the actual crossing where Pharaoh gets drowned, 
there are different words for walls in the Old Testament, multiple different Hebrew words. And the word that is used for the water standing on either side of the children of Israel as they went across is the word that is used for a massive city wall. Now if you look at that map, do you see any place on that route that's taking them across a body of water whereby there would be a massive wall, like a city wall, standing on either side of them. City walls were huge things. In the ancient world, I was just in China, as you know, and I rode around the top of the walls of a city called Xi'an on a bicycle. The top of that wall is as wide as the top of the walls of Babylon, but the walls are not as tall as the walls in Babylon. Those walls are 100 feet high. The walls in Babylon were even more than that, like 200 feet high. Folks, that's a 20-story building. Those are massive walls. You look at that route, do you see any place where they are leaving Egypt, where they're crossing a body of water that looks like that? You don't see it on that map, do you? If that's in the back of a conservative Bible, you find these silly maps in the backs of all your Bibles, even the ones that are published by fundamental organizations, because they just copy the map that the other guy had. And they've been doing that for the last 150 years. The liberals wanted to disprove the miracles of the Bible, and they had to get rid of the miracle of the Exodus. Now you're going to see as we go on that to do that, they did a whole lot of gymnastics with where was, you know, Goshen located? Well, you know, what period of Egyptian history can we get Goshen up there at the Nile Delta? Because you would got to have it where there's not a real miracle taking place. And so they put you down in the days of Ramses, 1290 BC, uh, to try to get you all the way up in the north. And then they put the storehouse cities of Python and Ramses up there in the north, and that way they've got you waddling through muddy water uh, marshes in the Sea of Reeds, because they say, well, it says Red Sea in the Bible, but it really means border sea, and the plants that grow along the border are the papyrus plants, and so that's the Sea of Reeds, and that's up there in the north. And everybody's been putting those maps in the back of their Bibles ever since then. Boggles the mind, but there you got it. Also, we asked the question last week, why does the Apostle Paul refer to the real Mount Sinai in Galatians 4, 24 and 25 as being not in the Sinai Peninsula? Why does he refer to it as being in Arabia? Galatians 4, 24 and 25, which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children, those who are still under the law. Paul is dealing with the issue of legalism. He's dealing with the issue of placing people back under the law. He say that's like, like Hagar, the Egyptian bondmaid. You're putting them back under the law. We're not under law, we're under grace. But in passing, he mentions the location of Mount Sinai. You know, Paul made a trip there. We'll talk about that when we get a little farther on. Paul knew where it was. Paul had been there. He's not guessing. He's been there. Elijah was been, had been there. Uh, we'll talk about that later. So why does Paul say that Mount Sinai is in Arabia when all of us think that it's in the Sinai Peninsula? Or really is it? That tells us something about this map that you've got in front of you. Which, by the way, I'm not giving this to you to memorize this map. This is a wrong map. This is simply a typical map that's in the back of most Bibles. It's wrong, but I'm going to try to show you why it's wrong. Notice where it puts the land of Goshen. It puts it up near the delta of the Nile River, right? Because after all, the land of Goshen was a lush, verdant place where lots of stuff grew. It was a great land. 
We also see Moses is making daily trips between Pharaoh and the children of Israel. So if it's too far away from there, you'd think, well, then he really couldn't do that if he could do this trip every day unless he had a, you know, his own private jet to get from one place to another place. And so you see Ramses uh, up there at the top, and we'll learn a little bit later on who the Pharaoh was at that time when that was the capital, when that was the seat of government. But, you know, it sticks it all up at the top. Remember, in ancient times, just like modern times, places have names many times based on the character and the nature of the place. Now, if you've done what I had asked you to do and looked at a Bible map, you probably noticed a number of things, but you can look at this one. Uh, if you miserably and slothfully failed to do what I asked, I've just given you a map so you'll understand what I'm talking about, because I'm going to ask a series of questions. In the evening messages a couple of weeks ago, I asked a series of questions that helps us place ourselves in the text, helps us understand what's going on. You were there kind of a thing. So notice the things on the map. First, the map shows the route of the Exodus and it puts the land of Goshen up in the Nile Delta region, slightly to the east of the two main discharge areas of the river. They couldn't have it all the way over to the left side because then the children of Israel had to cross a whole bunch of bodies of water and the text doesn't give you the, the option for crossing multiple bodies of water. Like if it was to the left of that lower branch of the, uh, or the left branch of the Nile, they'd cross one river, then they'd cross another river, then they'd cross a third river and finally they'd get on their, on their journey, right? That's why, that's why the map stick them over here, land of Goshen, to the east side of the uh, right, rightmost branch, the easternmost branch of the Nile River. Number two, you'll see that this map and most maps also show the city of Ramses in the northern part of, quote, the land of Goshen. Number three, you probably notice that it also shows Python and Sukkot a little to the southeast of Ramses in the lake of the area of Lake Kimsa and the great lakes and bitter lakes in the area of swampy marshes. And I just talked about that a minute ago, the, the reed marshes that are along there full of papyrus plants. Looks like a reasonable place to put them since it was a lush land, doesn't it? Of course, the Nile overflows its banks all up and down the Nile River every year and produces all kinds of great vegetation and crops all up and down the river. Number D, this route shows the Israelites crossing into what is known today as the Sinai Peninsula through the marshy area over the top of the Gulf of Suez and heading south. Do you see any great bodies of water there? If you're observant, you'll notice also that all the stopping points along the way are the names of places that the Bible says the children of Israel visited, stopped at, or passed by. If you look down, follow that route down, you find a bunch of names, Mara and Elim and Dovkab and, you know, uh, you see Rephidim and you see a bunch of other names along there. Follow those down. If you're really observant, you'll notice that all those place names have a question mark by them. In other words, they're merely a guess of the map makers. And I hope I can show you that they're really based on the assumption of the liberal theologians who hated the idea of a real miracle taking place in the text. G. If you're really, really observant, you will have noticed that at the southern bend in the Mediterranean Sea, you see where it says Mediterranean Sea, we see where it stops going north and south and sort of bends going east and west there. At the southern bend in the Mediterranean Sea, there's a little line that's marked Wadi El Arish, or Brook of Egypt. Some of your maps will say River of Egypt. Um, and there are some very interesting liberal reasons why, that, uh, why they want to make that the River of Egypt because of certain prophecies concerning Israel. You'll also notice various indicators of the wilderness of Shur, the wilderness of Zin, the wilderness of Paran, Midian, Edom, Moab, and so on. Those are all things that are mentioned in the text as we go through the Exodus wanderings. Most of those, probably in your Bible, do not have a question mark next to them, although some of them should have a question mark, and we'll talk about the reasons why. Now, I'm giving you a lot of basic geographical facts, and you think, you know, this, um, 
this is really boring. No, it's not. Because every word of God is pure. Our understanding of what took place at the Exodus helps you to understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Helps you to understand the power of God. If you let the liberals get away with this junk that's on these maps, and you always have that as a mental picture in your mind, you will never grasp the power of God doing what he did in the miracle of the crossing of the Red Sea, which is the greatest and most incredible miracle of the entire Old Testament. More than six million people crossing between two walls of water that are as high as city walls, and completely escaping the Egyptians, never to see a living Egyptian again. He, they saw dead ones the next morning washed up on the shore, which doesn't happen in a marsh. Satan hates the miracle of the crossing of the Red Sea. That's why I'm giving you some facts so that when some liberal or some ignorant Christian takes you to the maps in the back and says, well, look, it shows right here on the map. There is Mount Sinai down at the end of the Sinai Peninsula. You can give them some facts, and we're going to talk about those facts from scriptures right now. I'm helping you to observe. One of the first things you learn in Bible study is observation. If you want to do inductive Bible study, you have to learn to observe. You have to learn to observe what is in the text. You have to learn to observe with precision. You have to learn to put together the little tiny parts. So that when you come to the end and you put them together, it works and nothing has to be squeezed into place. It fits perfectly. The liberals' ideas don't fit at all in the text. They're someplace else in a different box. You'll notice also that the map puts Mount Sinai down near the bottom, the southern end of the Sinai Peninsula. They may have the words something to the effect of traditional location. <laughs> yeah, traditional how many traditions are wrong? Did you know that everything that's not based on the Word of God usually ends up being wrong? Some of them say Jebel Musa, which is Arabic for Mountain of Moses. I don't think Islam is particularly excited about finding the real Mount Sinai, because after all, it would demonstrate God's power on behalf of his chosen people and Islam hates the Jews and the Christians. You'll also notice that when the route on the map, you follow your little line there on the map for a second, reaches Etzion Geber, the question marks disappear. That's a place that can generally be identified. You'll notice also there are no question marks at Kadesh Barnea and all of the following locations. So now, back to the questions. Have you ever before I brought it up last week. Have you ever tried to figure out what Paul was talking about when he talked about Mount Sinai being in Arabia? Now, since I know you didn't look at this map, I know you didn't look at the other map, <laughs> but have you ever tried to look at a map any time in history to figure out where Arabia is in relation to most of the coastline of Egypt? Now, in the back of your Bibles, you probably have another bigger map that shows a, a gigantic overview of the ancient world, like this one here. I didn't make you copies of this. But you see, here's Egypt right here, and there's the Nile River. And now, if we're talking about a border sea, what is the border sea, not counting the Mediterranean, because nobody believes they crossed the Mediterranean. What's the border sea of Egypt? It's the Red Sea, and it runs the entire length of the country of Egypt. And what is directly across from Egypt, across the Red Sea? You can see it in your own Bibles. It says Arabia. We're crossing from Egypt into what Paul says is Arabia. Whoa, that's a pretty wide sea. You probably got a little uh, indicator there on your map that shows you how many miles for so many inches. Now, don't try to figure it out now. I'll tell you up front. It's 118 miles wide at the point where they crossed, which we'll try to prove later. That, folks, is a real miracle. 
118 miles. Did you know the text actually gives you the exact necessary amount of time for crossing at a pace of about five miles an hour? Oh, they were moving it. They were moving it to move that fast, but they were all in good shape. Remember, we talked about that. God had just put them through 40 years of a national exercise program. It says there was not one weak person among them, and they were running for their lives because the Shekinah glory was behind them, pushing them forward, and through the Shekinah glory, they could hear the armies of the Egyptians yelling and screaming and hollering and carrying on, and they could hear those chariots, and they could hear those horses, and they were running for their lives. Folks, we have a miracle the devil doesn't want in the Bible because it shows the sovereignty of God. And Satan is a type and a picture, or Pharaoh is a type and a picture of Satan in Scripture. Egypt's the picture of the world. It's used that way in the New Testament. It's a real place, but symbolically it stands for Satan and his kingdom of the world, and they're chasing the people of God across the impassable sea. We got some exciting stuff that's going on in the text. I'm just giving you little introductions today. Man, I can't believe my time is almost up. All right, let's move on. Um, so, have you ever wondered what is the western coastline of the Sinai Peninsula? Okay, was it inhabited at that time? Look at your map. Western is the left side. You see where the map is? You see the little arrows going down there? Okay, that is the western side of Sinai on the Gulf of Suez. Not on the Red Sea, but on the Gulf of Suez. Have you ever wondered if there's anything along that coastline? Was it inhabited during the time of the Exodus? If it was inhabited at the time of the Exodus, by whom was it inhabited? Do we have traces of those people who lived along the western side of the Sinai? Are there archaeological remains that show us that there were people there and that indicate who those people were? I'll tell you yes, but I won't tell you yet who they are. Now, let me ask another question. Did you ever wonder about how six million people could wander around in the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years and not leave a trace of ever having been there? Did you know the archaeologists have hunted and hunted and hunted? Can you imagine six million people wandering through an area for 40 years and never leaving a trace? I mean, that's a pretty good trick. Because the people who did live there left traces, but they weren't Jews. And it can be proved who they were. How could they wander in the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years and never leave a trace? Another question for you. I hope you're writing some of the questions down and that you at least think about them this week, even if you don't do anything. Do any other passages in the Bible tell us the exact date of the Exodus? Is the Exodus linked to some other date in the Bible that we know for certain so that we can date the Exodus? The answer is yes. But I'm not going to tell you yet because our time is up for today. Do archaeological remains tell us who the Pharaoh was at the time of the Exodus and where his seat of government was located? Once you determine the time of the Exodus, Egyptian history is very well and easily dated. Very, very well dated because it's all engraved in the monuments. So we know who all the Pharaohs were, one right after another. So if we can determine the exact date of the Exodus, we can determine who the Pharaoh was, and if we can determine who the Pharaoh was, we can determine from the monumental inscriptions where his seat of government was located. That'll tell you if Moses is making daily trips between Pharaoh and the children of Israel in the land of Goshen, that will tell you which way the children of Israel had to go and where Python and Ramses, the two storehouse cities that they were building, are located. It's a lot of questions that have to be answered. 
I hope at least a few of them have come to your mind as you were thinking about the Exodus as we've been going through. It is one of the most astounding miraculous events in all of history. In the Old Testament, the most astounding miraculous event, the resurrection of Christ, the most astounding in the New Testament. So, the big question in relation to our text today on the map I gave you. Look at the map now. You find Pihahirot, Migdal, or Baal Siphon. That's the command that was given to Moses just before the Exodus. Now look carefully on your map. You find those things. Listen, listen there. I'll give you just a minute. Hunt for it. It'll be up there in, in the left someplace because you see where Python and Sukkot are written down. But do you see Pihacherot? Do you see Migdal? Do you see Baal Tzaphon? Is it on your map? Everybody who thinks it's on the map that you just found it, please raise your hand. Everybody who looks at it and says it's not on the map, please raise your hand. Yeah, it's not on the map, is it? Because one of those things means mouth of the gorges. Doesn't look like there's anything around there that looks like a gorge. Definitely there's not. I've been there. Nothing there that looks like a tower, which is a word that's often used for mountains. None of them up there in the Nile Delta. Nothing that looks like Baal Tzaphon, Master of the North. What in the world does that mean? You know, maybe the reason that you can't find them is because not only are they not there, but there are no topographical features anywhere in that area that would match up. There are no gorges, no towers like mountains, and the route is going, what, south or north? Does the route go south or north? Everybody who thinks it goes south, please raise your hand. You can respond when I say, which way is it going? Say, south! It's going south! Well, that certainly doesn't fit with Master of the North, does it? Houston, we have a problem here. Okay, are you with me so far? Now, I've took a little bit of time on this, but it's important. I ask that because this generation is so used to our GPSs that most of our young people have no idea how to read a map for the purpose of actually getting somewhere. They can look at a map of the United States and say, wow, that's really neat. Look, here are all these places. But if you gave them that map and said, now get on the road and go from here to Los Angeles, they couldn't do it. So let's take those questions, which we'll do, the Lord willing, next week, one at a time, see if we can answer at least most of them from the Bible, with only archaeology and secular history demonstrating the truth of Scripture. Not, not proving Scripture, but they demonstrate the truth of Scripture. And the first will be the date of the Exodus. The Bible gives us several indicators concerning the date of the Exodus. According to Second Chronicles, the temple was completed in the 11th year of Solomon's reign. It took seven and a half years to build, and it tells us how long it was from the Exodus till the date of the building of the temple. And we can prove that. That's well within the range of, of biblical history. Well, anyway, we'll study that, the Lord willing, next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. If we would simply study it, observe it, and then see the foolishness that the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons are trying to throw at us to disprove that you are the supernatural, powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God who does all things perfectly. And your word is always true. It's true from the beginning to the end, from the first word to the last word, the Alpha to the Omega. Even as our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the living word, is true and the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The one who is indeed the God who led the children of Israel through the wilderness wanderings and across the Red Sea. The one who led them across the river Jordan and into the land of conquest. The one who always watched over them. The one who gave the great prophecies concerning the coming Messiah. The one who came in flesh at the virgin birth. Our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who has died for our sins and risen from the dead. The one who gives us, through faith in him alone, eternal life. Father, we praise you. You are great and majestic God. You are the God who is there. You are the God who lives. You are the God to whom someday we will give an account for the deeds that we have done in this body, whether good or bad. And only if we come under the blood of Jesus Christ will those deeds be forgiven. 
Only if we trust in Him will we be forgiven. Only if we claim Him for eternal life will we be forgiven. Only if we believe in Him with all of our heart, confess Him with our mouth that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father, I pray that if there's anyone listening to this message today, either here in this auditorium or listening over the internet, that today they might fall on their faces before you, the sovereign God of the universe, and confess, I am a sinner. I'm lost. But I believe with all my heart Jesus died for me, that he was buried and that he rose again, proving that his death in my place is true. I receive him now. I believe on him. Give me your gift as you promised of eternal life. And Father, I pray that that one would be born again, born into your family this day, drawn irresistibly by the power of your spirit, by the hearing of your word, for faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and believe on Jesus Christ for eternal life. And for those of us who do know him, help us to learn to walk by faith, to trust him. The Israelites had to spend 40 years wandering through the wilderness learning to walk by faith, learning to trust the God who was leading them. Father, we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 621. Tell me the old, old 